What is your freedom worth to you? Each of our guests had a light bulb moment. They longed to live rather than merely exist. They smashed through their fears and programmed minds, trusting themselves, their faith and their survival instincts. Leaving the guilt, fear, oppression and drudgery of their past. For a brighter future. They took a brave and courageous step into Freedom. This is their story of how they got a life. Welcome to Get a Life Podcast, X Cult Conversations. You matter, and so does your story. Trigger warning discussion on sexual harassment. Viewer discretion is advised. everyone. Welcome back to Get a Life Podcast, X-Cult Conversations. I am Cheryl, an ex-member of the Exclusive Brethren or the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And today joining me is Ben Woodbury from Australia, Craig Hoyle from New Zealand, who are also both ex-members. Today we have a special guest returning. Although her first time on here, she had to remain anonymous. Joey Green is also an ex-member who left more recently. She left just over a year ago, and her first podcast was podcast number 93, if you want to catch up with that one before this one. Today, Joey is going to expand on her journey inside the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, and we are also going to talk about a court case that Lee and Miles Admiral were involved in. Thank you, Joey, for joining us again. I know you couldn't give your full story last time, and now that things have changed, we're excited to hear the rest of your journey. So I am going to pass it over to you and let you get started. Thank you. Um, So I am, I I identify as non-binary, so I go by she, they pronouns. I'm from the, they call it the Vancouver locality. It's actually located in Langley now. Um, We moved out of Vancouver in 2008 because the pricing was going up of houses and everything like that um so we moved to langley and my parents are curtis and nikki green from langley um but yeah i guess i wanted to get started with the guilt and the signs side of things um so about probably three years ago now maybe just a bit more there was a little one who passed away in vancouver and everyone started preaching that this was a sign to us. Um, and I was at this point really, really struggling with my internalized homophobia. And I was reading like lesbian romance novels and taking am I gay quizzes on my phone. And I saw this incident as a sign that God was punishing all the people in Vancouver because I was gay. Um, I felt really, really horribly about this for the longest time because I was convinced that my homosexuality was the cause of this accident and this little boy's passing. Um, And after that, I kind of felt like I had a glowing sign above my head telling everyone I was gay and that he was gone because I just couldn't be attracted to men and be normal. And I felt really horribly for the family. Um, But also the to the people who preached about it being a sign i don't believe in signs anymore and i can't begin to tell you how the guilt that that kind of preaching puts on people's shoulders and it almost drives you away from believing in god and the church and everything like that um yeah it's just really not a nice feeling to have people telling you that things are signs and then you internalize that and put a lot of blame on yourself for it yeah and that's a really big thing inside isn't it it's huge everything everything when something goes wrong it's somebody in the locality that's done something right and it 100 percent is a backpack you wear especially if you were the person that is either a hiding from something or is a family that's being exploited so yeah it is a horrible horrible feeling Um, Last time I was on, I spoke about a letter I wrote to my parents right before I left, Um, but I also want to touch on a letter I wrote 
about three years ago now, I think. Um, that was my coming out letter. I don't actually have a copy of it and I don't remember what I said, but the circumstances around it are a huge part of my journey. So I just want to touch on that. Um, one Friday night, I stayed home from a dinner invite. And at this point, I was really struggling with my anxiety and depression. I was super easily overstimulated and overwhelmed. So, you know, the Friday nights were always loud music and a lot of chatter. And I usually just sat in the corner and left early because I got overwhelmed and started having anxiety attacks. Um, but I had figured out a way around the streamline internet protection. And so I spent my evening reading a book. Um, I think it was a lesbian romance novel or something like that. And my parents had an internet service that showed the usage on each device. So when they got home that evening, they confronted me about having been on my phone all evening. And I started off trying to deny it. And when that didn't work, I ended up convincing them to just leave it be for that evening and I'd explain the next morning. Um, <clears throat> anyway, over that night, I stayed up and wrote them a letter. Um, I kind of felt like I was in a corner and it was only my only choice to, um, was to come out to them. I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but I remember having to write around tears that were falling on the page and I was super scared because I was admitting to the one thing that I was really ashamed of and that was really affecting me the most at the moment. And when I finished, I left it on my bedside table. And the next morning, my mom woke me up and asked if I wanted her to take the note to my dad. So I told her yes and just went back to sleep. Um, I didn't talk to my dad for the rest of the day, but my mom came back later in tears and she walked in and just gave me a massive hug and apologized that I had to go through everything alone and Aww. I'm really thankful for that compassion there um didn't necessarily turn out great later on but I'm super thankful for that moment there and did your did your dad how did he respond to it after that did he ever come and talk to you um I'm not I don't really remember ever having a specific conversation about it really it was just kind of something we avoided we talked about it quite a bit later when it became an obvious issue again. But yeah, I, I don't recall having a conversation at that time about it. Hmm. And what was their general like view of it? Was, was their approach, this is something we can work through, this is something that can be cured, can be fixed, or were they genuinely curious as to how you felt, why you felt? Um, I think in that letter, I told them that it wasn't a choice that I would make because obviously I wanted to stay with my family and everything, but they told me that they could get me help and it could be fixed and it would all be better sort of thing as long as I did what I was told. Mm -hmm. were, you, were you aware at that point of how the brethren had tried to help other gay people? Um, I think the most I'd heard about it was that they had given someone medication for it, um, which I wasn't aware of who at the time or what exactly. Um, and I think we had a few people in our area who had also overcome. Um, and I, at that point, was really just hoping that I could be fixed um, mm -hmm. and return to living a normal life as, yeah. And just out of like curiosity, was it men you heard about or women? Because like when I was in there, I never had, like, I never thought women were gay, to be honest. I never, although I did understand what a lesbian was, like I never, I never thought that brethren women, and obviously brethren women, I feel like in general can get away with a lot more. So it's kind of, you know, I guess if you have your babies and go back to life, you can kind of put it aside, not dismissing at all how toxic and horrific a journey it must be. Um, I do, yeah, I do feel like it's a bit much easier to hide a butch sort of woman w within, you know, the community than it is a flamboyant gay is what I'm trying to say, <laughs> a flamboyant gay guy. That's why I think is is why I never really thought of it. Like I just thought it was normal um, that there weren't women that were. So did you ever hear of 
Um, like, no, I I didn't really ever hear of women that ever came, women I guess. who were yeah fixed or whatever they however they like to put it. Um, it was mostly just men. Yeah. Um, later on, I heard vague mumblings about women who had gone on to live normal lives with their families and whatnot, but I didn't really know anything of it at the time when I came out. I guess a lot of that then would have been regional as well, because I'd look back at, you know, women and girls I knew that were, you know, butch presenting, but a lot of them were from rural communities or and came from like farming families where it was pretty common for girls to be out there running machinery and gutting sheep and all that kind of stuff. And so I think it was like fine for the females to cross over into that male territory, but never the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Gender, yeah. gender roles were very, um, can you say like law, law, you know, laid down as law. And that's what I mean by women seem to get away with a little bit more. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, how isolating though for you like i think about how isolating it was for me and for other gay men that i've helped leave but i can't even imagine how isolating for you like it, it, some of the, you know we had people to look to like i knew that craig had left and was you know appearing to live a good and happy life you know from what you can see from the outside <laughs> and same with other people like matt cook and that you yeah i i never i, I can only imagine how isolating it would have been for you yeah, there needs to be more lesbians come out and write books. <laughs> There's that's what you can do, Joey. <laughs> we'll just start with sharing their story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next thing I kind of want to touch on is the homophobia and the Soji movement in our area. Um, from what I can remember, I attended kindergarten for one day before my parents found out that my teacher was a lesbian and pulled me from that school. So I ended up going to that school for one day and then I was switched to a French immersion school after that. Um, I'm not sure the exact reasoning behind it, um, but the one memory I have from that day was that my teacher read A Kissing Hand for Chester Raccoon, which is a story about a mother raccoon who kisses her kid's hand and then tells him that he can open it and put it on his face throughout the day if he ever misses her i believe or something along those lines so it was clearly detrimental to my mental well-being um having her read that to me <laughs> um, heaven forbid you know about mother's you know a mother's love a genuine mother's love um i grew up in the bible belt in the fraser valley um for those who aren't familiar that basically means that the city i live in and the ones around it are fairly religious um christians and other religions are quite prominent around here there's a lot of churches and whatnot but recently they're catching up with the times a little bit more um in 2017 there was a lot of protesting for and against the soji movement which according to their website the goal of their program is to help educators make schools inclusive and safe for students of all sexual orientations and gender identities at a soji inclusive school students gender does not limit their interests and opportunities and their sexual orientation and how they understand and express their gender are welcome without discrimination um, obviously the brethren are anti-soji and my dad was quite involved in that so um he said at one point i believe that his children might not have the maturity to handle this most personal and most sensitive topic which um <laughs> i was buried deep in the closet at the point that he said that so i i think i might have had the maturity to handle that um but I know last time we had talked about how homophobia seemed to always come up at family gatherings and whatnot, and I get how it might have seemed like it more, especially because I was in the closet, but also my dad was quite involved in this stuff, so it was definitely coming up a fair bit in relation to his protesting <laughs> that he did. Um, and then there's one lady who ran for counselor or something like that in our area um 
who the Brethren supported, and she was really opposed to a recent bill in British Columbia that would ban conversion therapy. Um, and she made this a part of her campaign was, I would keep conversion therapy around. So that was... Wow. Um, thankfully, that bill passed anyway. So conversion therapy is illegal in Canada now. But she was quite sure that it shouldn't be because people can get fixed or something. Sounds like a self-projection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what um, was that like having your, your dad be a part of the protesting and stuff like that? Um, I mean, on the surface, I was kind of behind it. Like I, I would mm -hmm. say things that like aligned with his views and whatnot, but um, at the same time, I was kind of like, well, I guess I could never come out and mm -hmm. never be myself because clearly he doesn't like that. Um, so it was kind of isolating as well. Um, and just, yeah, oh, yeah, fairly hurtful. And I mean, I know you've talked about this before, Ben, where you were, you know, very homophobic yourself when you were in inside, right? Where you, you don't have a choice, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You think, you know, it's kind of like believe the lie, you become part of the lie, you know, it disappears, but bury your head in the sand, but it does, you know, it doesn't. Um, yeah, it doesn't go away, obviously. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I can't imagine how, like, it's it's already hurtful enough to, I think, like I said, last time we were on this chat, Joey, like you are hyper aware that you are gay. So you are over, overly sensitive to, and not nothing wrong with that, um, you're overly sensitive to anything in terms of anything that could at all eliminate the fact that you're gay. So you often overhear conversations about gay. Like your ears are always on constant alert for the term yeah. gay or anything related yeah. to. And I can only imagine how much more the injury would be if you had somebody actively, that was a family member that actively campaigned um about it like i often think about um you know the doctor that um prescribed you medication was trying to fix you craig and you know i often think that you know his own family members are gay i i i can only imagine how how much the injury would be mm -hmm. like how how toxic that behavior is well, you just end up living your life in a permanent defensive crutch, like that fight or flight. You're just listening to everything because you never know when you're going to have to jump. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you if you've listened to podcast 112 with Matthew, uh, he talks about it in there, right? Where he was, he they had told him when he had asked about certain things, and they had, he had asked about um, Craig's name got brought up and the chemical castration, and they had told him, well, he chose it. He chose to take it, that it was, he wanted to take it. And I'm like, well, we went, I mean, Ben, I know you went on a rant with that on, on that last podcast where it was like, well, of course you don't have any choice. Right. So I'm going to, I'll let you Craig respond to that whole comment with, with, you know, like it's not your choice. <laughs> well, I would say the, um, the issue of choice was canvassed fairly extensively by the New South Wales Healthcare Complaints Commission. And it, but personally, for me, there's two things. First of all, when you're in that environment, of course you want to change because yeah. you know that being gay is not accepted by any of the people you love and care about. And the only way that you can avoid being cast out is to try and change. So, of course, you want to change. And we all had this experience. Like, I genuinely thought that Bruce Howes would be able to wave his hands over me and turn me straight. <laughs> and I was kind of surprised when that didn't happen. And... um saying yes okay yes that is what i wanted as a teenager does it was it the right thing for me absolutely not but i was responding to the conditioning of the Brisbane yeah. environment and the idea as well that you have the option of saying no because if you follow the Brisbane logic through they believe that bruce Howes is god on earth and everything he says is god voice god's voice speaking to you directly um, and to say no to Bruce Howes is like saying no to God. And so if Bruce Howes says you should go and see a doctor, you should look at treatment for your sexuality, like you're never ever going to say no as a teenager in the Britain. 
it, it'd be like telling God himself to go, you know, it's like, fuck you, God, is kind of what you're saying if you've turned down something from Bruce Hales. And so this whole idea that people in groups like the Virgin, oh, that's their choice, they can say no. Um, you know, I call bullshit on that. Yeah. Could you imagine if you had said no? Like, but it's just not an option. I mean, I mean, look, I, I look at Joey and everything that you've been through. I mean, obviously we've chatted a lot. So I, I know you beyond everything that we're saying on here. And I do like, could you imagine Joey turning around and being like, like, no, I am who I am. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to still be a part of the brethren. I'm going to just, I just need you to accept me as I am. There's no way. There's no way that any three of you would have been allowed to stay a part of the exclusive brethren or the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, which is what it is now, and stay gay. There's it's no not way. A, not an option. Yeah, it's it's literally not an option. And also, religion aside, the, despite the fact that you're conditionally groomed all your life to bow and scrape and to Bruce Hales. The religion aside, you you are not equipped with the knowledge, with the resources to to um, look up what you're about to undertake. You're undertaking like drugs that or, or making choices that are are permanent and will have side effects that are permanent. Like you, you you're not equipped to do that. You you don't even have full internet access to Google like the repercussions yeah. of taking this. Yeah. You're not you're not yeah. being. There's, there's a conflict of interest that in, in in the sense that the doctor is the same cult, same religion. Your family are, aren't, again, equipped with any mm. sort of academic knowledge to help you understand what you're about to undertake. So, of course, you, you, it's not a, there's no choice. There's no option. You actively choose it because you want to conform and your sense of belonging that is the brethren is at risk. And so, you yeah. want to be with your family. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you choose it. Yeah. Like, when I no had option. this, when when those drugs were prescribed to me, there was no discussion about potential side effects and what the risks and benefits were, or whether this was the correct application for this drug. And I was just written a prescription with enough repeats for me to just take this medication for a year without ever seeing another doctor. And it's like, well, <laughs> how is that going to go? And you then. Then you start, and it's difficult when you're in a, an environment like that, you start feeling these side effects, but you're in such a sort of state of emotional turmoil that it's hard to, so when I started feeling sluggish and anxious and depressed and all of those things, I just thought it was because of everything that was going on in the brethren. and it took a few weeks to be like, ah, maybe it's these pills the doctor gave me. <laughs> and so, um, like, it's not not even just about being able to, figure out what's going on but you know you need to have the framework to even have the language to describe what's happening to you mm -hmm. um and i think this is like for anyone who comes out as gay and the brethren before you can come out as gay you have to realize what being gay even is and that there are words that describe how you feel mm -hmm. yeah how have your parents um responded to you coming out as non-binary joey um they don't actually know um i was speaking with my therapist about this and we talked about the idea of how it's becoming more popular to invite people in rather than come out so it's mm. not like a huge thing for you. you have to do all the time but rather you Boundaries. slowly invite people that you trust into your inner circle and you can tell them about yourself or whatever's going on with your life rather than just coming out. Yeah. That's really good. That's a really brain. good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, could could you explain a little bit around as well about what it means for you to be binary and what that non-binary and what that um, journey was like? Yeah. Um, so obviously I grew up in a really transphobic environment, so I'm still kind of learning the correct terminology around that. Um, but I've just recently come into a place where I'm safe to start exploring my gender identity. It's just always been part of who I am. Even when I was little, I like never thought about my gender unless I was absolutely forced to. So like at school, I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm a girl, so I can't do such and such or whatever. I, the only time I thought about it was lining up to go back into class 
we had to line up boys and girls. So mm-hmm. I would be like, oh, well, I guess I have to go line up with the girls then. <laughs> um, and going to the bathroom and things like that. Um, but even when I was a little kid, I always wanted to one day walk down the street and have people wonder like, oh, is that a boy or is that a girl? And looking back, I think it was more about just one day being in a place where I could present myself as me and not as who everyone around me wanted me to be. So I think even as a little kid, I just kind of craved a place where I could just be who I was and not have people question that. Um, <clears throat> even like recently talking about gender, I'm kind of just like, I'm not a boy or a girl. I'm just Joey. I'm just me. <laughs> That's Aww. who I am. Um, when I was a kid, I was outside playing with tools and trucks and for my fourth birthday I was gifted a hacksaw which I feel like sums up my childhood in one sentence (laughs) um but I'm really grateful that my parents let me be a tomboy and didn't force me into dresses and frilly clothes and whatnot um but basically at this point it to me it means that I get to be who I am I don't have to follow the gender norms for a boy or for a girl I can just be me um but obviously it means different things to different people as well so to each thing. yeah and and I was gonna say that that's that's totally okay like you I think we've had previous podcasts where you know which I wasn't on but I actively wanted to say something about because I fully believe that there is no normal gay and there's no normal hetero. Yeah. There's no normal, like there is an expression of who you want to be and that's okay. And quite frankly, it's nobody else's fucking business who you want to be, where yeah. you want to be and who you want to be with. As long as you're happy, safe and peaceful, then that's all that matters. Yeah. And I think as, as humans in a society, we try and put labels and put things into boxes because it all feels neat and good and I feel safe and okay. And, and, you know, with the real world, and re- that's not reality. That's not the real world. We- it is a confusing, um, you know, world we live in. And as long as you can be okay with that and, you know, um, it-, it works for you, then that's fine. Like it's not, it's, we-, we should be respectful of people's choices. There's no, there's no like, and I think the reason I'm bringing it up because I was, I was so aware of how that would have made me feel when I was back in the Brethren. If I had heard a Brethren male that had left say, I'm not a sissy gay, I'm not a femme gay, I'm more of a normal gay. There's no normal. We're, we're in touch with our femininity, we're in touch with our masculinity, and that's okay. If someone to dip more into either, I dip into both. Like I wear pearls and I wear a lumberjack top. Like who cares? Um, yeah. At the end of the day, it's how I, I feel great doing that. And so just on your journey, Joey, you've got a, a group of people out here that will support you on that, however you want to feel, um, as long as you feel safe. And I think that's the biggest misunderstood thing in the LGBTQ plus community, right? Is that, and it changes, it's fluid. It changes. Like, I mean, I have, I have a family very, very close to me with their kids that I think, I think the whole point of everything that's exploding in the world today is get out of labels, get out of what it is. Like it shouldn't matter to you. If that person is kind, if that person is caring, if that person, like it does, it's, it's, you, you said it perfectly, Joey, where you just want to be Joey, right? Why do we have to attach other labels to it? And I do think that that is one of the things that your generation is teaching us is it doesn't matter. Like get out of the labels, get out of what we think society should be classified in this group and this group. And let's just be who we are. I mean, I've met a lot of non-binary people who would blow anybody else out of the water with their compassion. They're, I mean, they're just normal human beings like everybody else. How they decide to present themselves to the world, is that's their choice. And I guess that's the biggest thing that I get so frustrated and angry over is that when we see comments and we have people that are replying and people that are just, they're not thinking about what they're putting down in a comment before they put it. And it's just ridiculous. It's just, I just think that the world has made this much more difficult than what it needs to be instead of just letting everybody be who they want to be. 
And for those that are commenting from a place of, you know, you, you came from a, you came from the brethren to the same cult that we did, you of all people should have, should understand, right? It's, it's a, um, it, it's, we're, we all live in the same world out here. And quite frankly, it's not nobody's business. Like it doesn't, it, it doesn't affect you and it's not setting some standard. There are no standards. You live in the real world. There's no brethren standard. There's no, yeah, it, <laughs> me too. I, I get very frustrated about it too, Cheryl. Yeah. I just think you were in a cult for how many years? You should, you should be just given a complete free pass to experiment and explore who you are and who your identity is. Like with, and expect, nobody should comment on it. You should just be given that free pass of like, Joey gets to be Joey, like in whatever she, they decide to be. Yeah. It gets me riled up. I get slightly, I'm just baffled about why people feel threatened by these things. It's like, yeah. what impact does it have on your life? It has zero impact. Like, why do you, why do you have to be a hater? Well, they, you've just said it, they feel threatened. You know, you know, when new knowledge is presented to us or something's unknown and we don't understand it, our natural primal instinct is to feel either fear or um, fight it. And that's usually what comes out, yeah. the, the feeling threatened and standing up and fighting it. I think, like the, the generational thing is interesting as well, because I'm, um, oh, you know, when you're, when you're young, you're like at the cutting edge of radical thinking where you think you are. And then you get a bit older and I'm finding now there's another generation of activists that are coming through mm -hmm. under me that are just like a little bit more radical than I am. And I'm just like, oh, man, that's a bit far for me. <laughs> but I think You're just getting like, old, Craig. <laughs> but it's super, we often talk about this at work, is like, you know, you can't just lock in your generation of thinking as this is how radical yeah. we're going to be and we're not going to go any further because there's just going to be wave after wave after wave mm -hmm. of young people coming through who see the world in very different terms to how mm -hmm. we see them and to how older generations see them and i think like what i really admire is the people who have who are able to hold that space and say hey there's this whole new generation of people coming through that see the world in a totally different way and that's mm -hmm not necessarily how I see it, but that's all good. Like we're never all going to see yeah. it the same way. And to come from a place of curiosity instead of mm. judgment, right? Like, mm. I mean, I did day home for like 12 years. So it was like, that was, I had to instill that very, very early on when I've got six boys in my house, right? You just, you have to come from a state of curiosity instead of just that judgment right away. Like to mm. me, I just, I love having conversations with people like this. I love it because you get to understand just, how they're thinking and how they are who they mm -hmm. are i mean i think that that's that is the big thing out of all of this and my message i guess for anybody watching this and instead of judging joey be curious right i mean she's mm -hmm. the kindest human you're ever going to meet i uh, like i mean just love her and, and that aside like from a purely academic perspective if you think about it like okay imagine if science or anything like technology had that mindset. No, no, no. We have, we have the most advanced. Our generation has thought of the most in terms of science or medical health or we wouldn't be where we are today. Like we've in a space of 70 years of taking flying to, you know, landing on the moon. Like it's, if we had that approach to everyday thinking, we wouldn't have the medical science. We wouldn't have the general science. We wouldn't have the knowledge we have today. So applied in all aspects of your life too. Yeah. Yeah. So getting back into your journey that you experienced, Joey, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is if you ever, if you ever had um, witnessed any sexual harassment or sexual abuse. Yeah, um, it, I experienced some myself. Um, it started when I was 16. Joey describes her sexual harassment, but due to legalities, we had to omit parts of this conversation. It happened all the time, and um, at one point he took a picture of my of my legs and then sent it to me with a leg and a tooth emoji. I guess suggesting that he'd like to bite my legs and or how good they looked, especially on days when I wore black tights. He'd be like, "Oh, your legs just look good," or he'd say, "Oh, if you just worked out, you could have like amazing quads." At one point he asked me what si what size skirt I wore and what my bra size was. Um, 
I was absolutely terrified and really just wanted him to leave me alone. And then afterwards, he would send me pictures asking for like my bra size, like send pictures of and then insert the bra size there. And that is the point where I finally drew the line, thankfully, um, and wouldn't give in at all on that. Then I went through a period in time where I would be driving along and I just have to pull over and burst into tears. And I didn't understand why. I was super ashamed at the time. I have to remind myself of how I was raised and the environment that I was raised in where you listen to your elders and you listen to men. I was between the ages of 16 and 20 when this happened. And I was struggling with my sexuality at the time as well and just super lost. I thought I would see something like this before it even started, or I thought it would never happen to me. And I just thought of so many ways to justify his actions and blame myself. But in the end, he was the adult in that situation. He knew better. And you know what? I totally relate to how when you're in there, it's just like you don't want anything uncovered. You want it to stop, but you don't want it to get uncovered because you're so you just internalize everything, right? The emotions, the whole shit, everything you internalize, literally everything that they should be feeling, you feel, and then you internalize that and carry it for both of you, right? When really, if we were brought up in a normal environment or had people around that we knew that we could trust and action would happen, right? You would go to them with the issue and it would be dealt with. But inside the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, it's not like that, right? We know from looking around us, things are not dealt with like that. You never hear of things being brought in up in meeting. Mm-hmm. Those kinds of things aren't brought up in meeting. They're not talked mm-hmm. about publicly. I think the worst thing was a lot of the stuff just hid in plain sight. Like growing up, I remember we had a great uncle who was referred to as Dirty Dave um, mm-hmm. because he would rope women and he was the one that, you know, your mom and your sisters would at all costs avoid going in for a hug and a kiss with because he was Dirty Dave and everyone knew how Dirty Dave acted. But but it was never, actually, this is sexual harassment or assault and someone needs to put a stop to this. It was just Dirty Dave became a running joke um, in the family and in the brethren more widely. And that's kind of, turning it into a joke kind of allowed it all to just kind of sit there in plain sight without ever being addressed. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's like they, they enable it and harbor it, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember one time he's um he's he's long dead now, so there's no defamation risk. But I remember one time he he grabbed a woman's bum as she was going into the hall and then her husband came along and just about punched his lights out and he was like what are you on about? She was she was just late for the meeting. I was trying to help her get in. No, no, you weren't. You're just being a uh, pervert. And then when like when they're more serious, like I know of somebody that was raped, and they, you know, they wanted to take it further or wanted something to be done about it, and they were essentially sat down and said, you know what, this is going to cost the family. Like, you know what, it's going to cost everybody for everybody to find out uh, about this. Well, here's a news flash. They're all going to find out about it anyway, and it's going to be very public when they do. Yeah. Or even worse is the ones who come forward and tell the leaders they've been raped and then get forced to marry their rapists. Yeah, yeah. What? That's insane. That's sad. So sad. Yeah, so many things wrong. I think if they just would realise that it's not as bad as what they think it is by bringing it forward, right? I mean, and this isn't just the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. There's lots of there's lots of places where things are hidden like this, right? If they would just realize that if they brought it forward, made it public, got the authorities involved, that would actually build their report. Like that would actually build them up. It would actually give them some credibility and integrity versus this constant hiding hiding underneath things. So one of the other questions that I wanted to ask you is um, about alcohol and alcoholism in um, the PPCC. What did you witness yourself in that department? Like, what did you witness with alcohol? Um, So going to school, there were boys in my class and previous classes who would bring alcohol in their water bottles to school. And um, we had to cover up for them occasionally, like wiping the room down, 
um, before teachers came in and emptying out water bottles and filling them back up with water and stuff like that. Wow. Um, <laughs> and I mean, we've heard that from other teachers too, right? That, I mean, that was in, well, I can't really say where it was, but yeah, on in other parts of the world, that same issue has happened. Yeah. Yeah. We used to have, um, like we found bottles of stuff stashed in like above rooms in the ceiling and stuff like that at school. Oh, yeah. And how old would have these boys been? Um, the ones in our class were in grade 12, so 17. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, they all also the, I don't know if it's global or what, but Vancouver at least, um, approached several liquor stores about, um, getting a kickback on any liquor purchases made by brethren to the school, um, I think they had to approach a few before they got a yes, because most of them were like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> we're not going to support schools for a liquor store. But yeah, I think they finally found one um, that if you go in, I think you have to show a card or something and they will give the school a kickback or something like that. That's insane. That's crazy. And I mean, we know that they have like a lot of their campus and co have alcohol in it, but I mean, this is a way for them to obviously you know, get a little bit of more money if they can find, you know, a liquor store that the the brethren frequent to still get some money. That's yeah, crazy. That's just insane. Our campus and code didn't have alcohol in it. I don't know if they like couldn't get permission or what, but they didn't have it there. So I guess this was their way of getting money back for alcohol. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's insane. Crazy. Wow. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to move forward. I really, we talked about how we wanted to talk about Miles and Lee Admiral in a situation that they were involved in um, this is a few years ago. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up was in podcast 112, you heard uh, Matthew. So Matthew was talking about when he was leaving his work and he was questioning them about some things and they had come right out and called Ben and Craig faggots, which is again in this world that term is just not used anymore. I mean, like, get with the 21st century. And the reason why I wanted to bring up this Lee and Miles Admiral court case that went on was that was exactly what happened how many years ago. And so, if you see that a term that was used how many years ago and they apologized for this, I'm going to bring up the court case here, it still is happening. It's still a term that is still used today and so it's still not cleaned up it is a term that is readily used in there and it is very 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 derogatory is people just don't use that terminology anymore so i'm going to share a screen with unless you unless you're gay and you're talking about fellow gays yeah so i am going to attach in the link below i will attach the full court case records i'm going to share a slide with you on this just kidding. And also on that note, Cheryl, like people, like the brethren still using the same terminology, that's, that's comes as no surprise as they have not evolved. You know, they don't evolve. They are the same religious group they were 140 years ago. Yes, there are stricter rules. Okay, so this is Lee Admiral and Miles Admiral. And yes, these are relatives of Lane's and he gave us full permission to say whatever we needed to say. So this is Lane's dad and his brother that were involved in this. So Lee Admiral is a member of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church in Montreal, Quebec. He was 16 and 17 years old when the attacks took place. And as we know, homophobia is instilled into the PBCC members from a very, very young age. So the following slides have been taken from the court transcript. So the present tense is used at times. So this is the case. So there's two men, um, Roger and Theo, were two gay men who had lived together as a couple at their residence in Point Claire since 1978. On July 18th, 2002, they became the first gay male couple to formalize their union under Quebec civil union law. The incidents involving the victims and the defendant occurred between April and November 2003, when the defendant was 16 and 17 years old. On April 18th, 2003, around 9 p.m., a dark blue pickup 
truck drove past the victim's residence. One of the passengers threw toilet paper from the truck onto their car and lawn. The couple called the police, filed a report, and gave police a videotape of the incident. The following day, on April 19th, 2003, someone was heard screaming, fucking faggots, from the street. When one of the victims looked outside, he saw the same dark blue pickup truck speeding away, tires screeching. On November 10th, 2003, around 11.30 p.m., so almost midnight, the blue pickup truck drove by again. According to the victims, a flare was thrown from the truck and huge flames and fireballs could be seen on the roof, rolling on the lawn and into the street. Although there was no damage to their property, the victims claimed to have been very frightened by the attack. Rightfully so. On November 21st, 2003, as the victims were driving home, they stopped at a convenience store and noticed the same blue pickup truck and a group of young people who had stopped to buy some beer. When the victims drove away, they were followed to their driveway and insults such as fucking faggots were yelled at them from the truck. Incensed, the victims decided to get back into the car, follow the truck, and finally identify the culprits. The truck turned onto a street called Broadview and drove into the parking lot of a community church. The victims stopped their car, effectively blocking the truck's way. The defendant got out of the truck and approached the victim's car. When the victim refused to move or open the window, the defendant repeatedly banged on the window, trying to open the car door and threatened to strike one of the victims with his fist. The victims heard the defendant say that he would rather break his fucking face than break his fist on the window. Then they dialed 911 from the car and the defendant ran away. The victims claim to continue to live in constant fear for their safety. They no longer listen to music. They have trouble sleeping and are constantly afraid of what might happen next. The couple has even canceled plans to travel together so as not to leave their home unattended. More particularly, Roger testified that the events caused him to relive the profound trauma of accepting his homosexuality and that it's still something he is trying to deal with with help from his psychologist. Theo, his partner, added that his once successful art artistic career has been destroyed. He is no longer able to paint because of his anxiety. The defendant explained that he had heard of the victims through the local papers and disapproved of their open, openly homosexual lifestyle, although he had never met them personally. His disapproval, disapproval of homosexuality stems from his religious beliefs as a member of the Brethren Church, a conservative Christian church that teaches that homosexuality is a sin. The defendant only admitted to calling them fags on one occasion, on April 18th, 2003, and he categorically denied ever using the word fucking as alleged by the victims. He also denied throwing a flare at the victim's property and claimed it was merely a firecracker with a small stick. He explained that there was no fire, only sparks, and all it did was go bang. He explained that it was late at night and that he was probably just trying to show off in front of his friends. With respect to the threats he uttered on November 21st, 2003, he explained that he merely wanted the victims to move their car so he could leave with his truck and that he would never have stricken, stricken either victim. Regarding his education, he claimed that although his father had told him that homosexuality is legal in Canada, he could not recall whether he had been told that homosexuals have rights or that discrimination and harassment based on sexual orientation are prohibited. I'm going to reread that again for you listeners. Regarding his education, he claimed that although his father had told him that homosexuality is legal in Canada, he could not recall whether he had been told that homosexuals have rights or that discrimination and harassment based on sexual orientation are prohibited. This is an outright omission of the truth. The PBCC are taught from a young age that homosexuality is sinful. The verdict. There is no doubt, given the facts established, that the damages caused by the defendant's actions were unlawful and intentional within the meaning of Section 49 of the Charter. On several occasions, he deliberately humiliated, intimidated, and harassed the victims. Given the gravity of the acts committed and the importance of dissuading others from engaging in similar behavior, yet also considering the defendant's apology and expression of remorse, the tribunal decided the amount of $2,500 to each victim was appropriate for punitive damages and 5000 to each victim for moral damages. So, like, this is an issue. It's an issue that was back then. And as we heard from our last our podcast 112, it still is an issue, 
right? This teaching is not taught in the school. There's no teaching out there on how to be compassionate or how to be open to having somebody else live around you that has a different lifestyle. And this is what we've been talking all along, right? It's just, it's, it's not accepted. And then you get this kind of behavior. This is one of the things that have always has been a worry of mine as we've brought a lot of these survivors on these podcasts. We're like, how many podcasts and over 111 podcasts that we're out here now. And because there has been no compassion given to anybody who has done these podcasts, we know how they're talking inside there. And all it takes is, is one person that is like this to come and think that they're doing the work for Bruce Hales. And I do think it is a huge issue that they could have on their hands if they don't stop and think about how they are running their church. Or even educate. Well, is, yeah. Right. Educate them. And this is an issue. Like when Bruce Hales says, do X, Y, Z by whatever means necessary. Yeah. Like your interpretation of whatever means necessary, like there's no limit to that. Like, do you, do you kidnap someone? Do you forcibly prevent them from leaving? Do you do like, do you, you take know, their the kids brethren. off them? Yeah. We know the brethren think they're above the law. You know, that's the assembly is the highest court in the land as they believe. Um, and so it's not, necessarily about what someone like Bruce Howes intends when he says do whatever it takes. It's about how extremely that's interpreted by the members. Um, yeah. And, and all it does take is one extremist within that extreme group to think he's doing the Lord's work or Bruce's work. And yeah. And, and get, you know, case in point, you know, I've got an ongoing court case with somebody um, that thought the same thing. And interesting, I had somebody reach out recently after, you know, all this stuff's come up about the Brethren and in papers, and they were at a uni day. I can't remember the exact year, but I've got it all written down. Um, Sydney campus went to a Sydney university, I think it was, and essentially they had a pride stand, like an orientation day where they showed what happened at the university. And I don't think they do this anymore because of that. There was essentially one there's one kid that essentially from sydney school they started heckling this pride stand and lunged and attacked this stand and there's there's video footage out there that they've all these kids put out their cameras and started videoing of him like screaming and yelling and abuse at this pride stand these other kids and literally went into full psychotic mode and yeah it's just really interesting like it, nothing has changed they're so uneducated they are taught from such you are taught from such a young age to literally hate i had a teacher or a couple of teachers reach out and share a story about an ex exercise they did at school where they had a little hand and they had to write for, you know on each finger five things that would make the world a better place and so, the majority of the kids wrote in there get rid of gays like that is like unbelievable unbelievable that mentality unbelievable but again not surprising yeah and i mean i've talked to lane about this situation right and he said this wasn't out of their character at all right like i mean and for lane to say that about his own family right it's just i don't know for myself it's just so sad that they're not taught how to be more open they're not taught how to be how to live inside a society that has different beliefs right the way that the spokespersons come back and give the remarks that they do in articles, that is what is most infuriating. It's the RRT people that go out and they're supporting certain things. These people have no idea how condescending they are, how racist they are, how homophobic they are. And, and then it comes out in kids. Again, they said he was what, between 16, he was 16, 17 years old when this was all going down, right? It is going to be their demise in our last podcast or in podcast 112 we heard matthew talk about how the person that he was talking to actually specifically said that the one thing that they wish they wish that the ex-brethren didn't exist so you have to understand that if a 16 year old gets a hold of that kind of a comment right and get some idea in their head of what they could do with that yeah 
And it's not it's not just sexuality here. We're talking about women yeah. that speak up. We're talking yeah. about sexist views, ageist views. We're talking about racist views. Like it's all in the same. Yes, there are. They have a separate vehement hate for um, the gay, the queer community. Like it, it's it's almost like unprecedented that you the hate they harbour for them. But it's it's in other areas too, like a, a political party that doesn't align with their views, yeah. even though they don't vote. You know, it's it's and it's 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 scary because you are you're teaching children and and kids to grow up like this this is why i think it's so important they don't have their own schools yeah i agree they they have to assimilate they have to integrate and learn and realize what the real world is Um, and i'm sure this is what you were talking about joey when you were talking about watching your dad do his protesting right i mean you witnessed it firsthand of how you being a kid having to support your dad and what he's doing because of his belief of like this can't uh, this can't be accepted yeah one thing that struck me as you were reading that out is how he admitted to using the word fags but not fucking because yeah. in there it's so awful to say fuck or anything along those lines yet it's perfectly okay to say fags i guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's like i didn't yeah. sin like i didn't swear that you know yeah, but eleven thirty so at was, night. He was out at eleven thirty night. They I, were getting I was literally. Theater, right? I was about to like eleven thirty at night. Don't you have a life? Yeah. Oh wait, you don't. I forgot you're in a cult. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, there is an article that was made from that. So there is a few articles. I'll attach a link to them below in the in the article, um, and you guys can go ahead and read this. But also on on that note, how traumatizing for a elderly couple that's probably been through the 60s 70s 80s um you know trauma that follows of coming out and and not coming out in a safe environment like they've probably already experienced that Mm -hmm. imagine being thrown back into that yeah yeah um and i'm just going to attach another article here it's from press progress that went through um they wrote a article on how the plymouth brethren christian church had done a campaign um, to try and stop gay marriage in Canada. Um, so I'll attach that article here. And then there's another article here that I wanted to, to touch on. And this was written by Michael Bachelard. And I'm actually, I'm going to actually get you, Craig, to just give you a quick comment on this article. Mm. Yeah, so this article was 2016, so it's eight years ago now. Um, and this was in response to, um, again, the the Brethren made a statement on a story. And one of the things that the Brethren said in their statement was they denied that they were homophobic. Um, And this is what you're saying about the spokespeople coming out and saying things, and they will just deny that they're homophobic, deny that they're racist, deny that they're sexist, deny that they break up families. And so this was a really good piece that just unpacked the headline says it all, the Brethren deny being anti-gay, here's proof they are. And if you go through the story, it's um, it's a compilation of all sorts of things that the Brethren have said and done, um, including the political campaigns they've run against um, gay marriage or marriage equality or um, Don't Ask, Don't Tell they campaigned against in the 1990s, which was the legislation around um, queer people in the US military. Um, you've got quotes from meetings with Bruce Hales. And um, this is something as well that the Brethren have not always tried to deny. Because if you go back 20, 30 years when it was more acceptable to be homophobic in society, so in 2006, Daniel Hales um, quite proudly told journalists that back when he was a boy, homosexuals went to prison and he thought that was a good thing. Um, wow. And... <laughs> Like, and for, and for Daniel House to say that, like, knowing that there's a chance that there could be gay people within his own, you know, wider family or family, like, how, how toxic? Mm. Yeah, and so then we've got um, these, the pamphlets that they've run in Australia and Canada, and um, they were organising political action. I remember when I was um, a teenager, the, the prayer meetings that we were holding about... Um, yeah. the civil union bill that was going through in New Zealand um, and as we say in the story there when um, the Australian um, government was 
this is a while ago now, 2004, proposing legislation to define marriage as being between a man and a woman. The brethren were in Parliament every day. Um, and yeah, that was really, in that was in Canberra, like in Australia. And there hmm. is they they actually sat down with um, the Prime Minister John Howard and. They, they were there helping write the Marriage Act. Remember, they used to boast about it. Like, remember being in a lounge room where, at my grandfather's, where Bruce Howes brought it up. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the very the very idea that the brethren would claim that they're not homophobic or that they're not anti-gay. <laughs> like, I mean, if they weren't homophobic, <laughs> how many people would still be in there? Well, maybe not be in there, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You wouldn't have to leave because you're gay, right? Yeah. Um, I want to come back to Joey for a second because she sent me some pictures that are absolutely your the 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 transformation that you went through from when you were in there to who you are now, and I think this is just so incredible to watch you come into your own skin. Um, Excuse the dirty mirror on this one, but <laughs> so I'm going to get you to walk us through what we're seeing here. Um, basically this was quite a while before I left and this was one of the outfits that I wore to meeting. Um, I absolutely hate dressing in anything like that now. In fact, I put on a skirt the other day and it gave me a panic attack. So I don't do that anymore, but <laughs> this is a standard dress for meetings and whatnot in there. Um, I have friends now who look at pictures of me from back in there and they're like, you were so dead inside back then. Yeah. Yeah, you look so unhappy. Yeah. And that the scars with their form, like they were just so big. <laughs> they were like, that wasn't even one of the bigger scarves that I've ever worn. Like, I usually stuck to one scarf form, as they call it. Um, but there were people in there who layered up three or four on top of each other. So it's just sticking out like a good five inches above their head. Oh. That was after I cut my hair. I, I think I had partially left at this point and I cut my hair to shoulder length before going Full. a little, little higher. But yeah, this was, yeah, yeah. it was on my way out there. Yeah. And, and you can tell you're coming into your own, like you're just owning your presence here. Like you can start feeling the confidence and that the, your appearance is really coming through of like, yeah, I know who I am. <laughs> there's actually life. Not yeah. that you can't see it here, but the other photo, there's actually life beginning to spark in your eyes. And then this is my favorite. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It, it. I like you look like you're about to run a, a board meeting, <laughs> CEO. <laughs> yeah. All the time in there, like when they're like, you got to dress up for meeting. I'm like, why can't I just wear a suit though? Because I feel like a suit is more me. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Uh, well, we're very, very grateful that you came back on and were able to fill in all the pieces that you never got to fill us in last time. So again, for those that haven't seen her other podcast, her other podcast was podcast number 93. So if you haven't watched it yet, definitely go back and rewatch that. And um, I am going Super to end. Proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just so incredible to see how far you've come and how you just really are owning who you are. And that's okay that it changes, right? Yeah. Definitely an evolution. And that's that's totally fine. Like you'll change your style, mm -hmm. you'll change the way you feel. You can change your religion. You know, that's the beauty of being out here. Yeah. Choice. You have choice. So I lost internet there and I have hooked back up. But unfortunately, Ben and Craig had to go back to work. So Joey and I are going to just finish this out. So go ahead, Joy. You were saying something when my internet cut, cut out about labels. Uh, I think people are just kind of hesitant to identify with anything particularly because then if they change it, they feel like they weren't valid to begin with. Like whatever they identified as first wasn't valid. And I don't think that's the case. I think it's just all a journey and not really any destination. So it's okay to change over the years. Everyone does. And yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. personally, I'm kind of drawn to labels because it just makes explaining things easier. But <clears throat> I also came across an article the other day about um, who we are without labels. It was like a journaling prompt as well. It was like 
put, write down who you are without your labels. So you aren't someone who does so such and such for work. You aren't a parent to someone. You aren't a child to someone. Who are you as a person? Yes. Yeah. It's really yeah. hard to do that. Yeah. And you know what? And I think those labels are good to have when you're trying to understand who you are. You're trying to understand a situation, but don't let labels con confine you to who you are for your entire life. Let those labels be fluid, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I think is important, right? Is, is just be flexible. And that's I think, the one thing that we're seeing time and time again is that the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church is not flexible, right? They don't allow for difference of opinions or different ways of beliefs like could you imagine what it would be like if we had a mainstream christian church and i mean i've known i i do i've i've, I've gone to united church here in red deer before where they like have a the gay pride flag painted on their walkway going up to the church right so there are churches that are out there that are accepting of these things and i think that's where the one thing that the plymouth brethren christian church have not evolved in. They've evolved in their technology. They've evolved in all these different ways, but they have not evolved with the 21st century when it comes to accepting people and their sexuality. And I mean, this is this is a massive thing in this world. Like almost everybody knows how to accept people who are gay. I mean, yes, we're still getting used to non-binary and trans and all those other um, ways of identifying with yourself, right? But just simply gay and lesbian, those are two simple things that they are really stuck way back in the 1900s with, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a way that they could accept homosexuality and um, trans people without accepting it all. Yeah, I think that that kind of thing is an all or nothing situation, yeah. and I don't ever see them accepting all of it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, I'm really, 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 really proud of you, Joey, for coming <laughs> on here and you know really presenting everything in a way that people just get to know you for who you are. Beyond, yeah. I mean, I think my goal in coming on this time was kind of just. I want people in there to realize that it doesn't have to be like a big thing for you to report it to someone. Like when it comes to sexual harassment, it, it doesn't have to be a massive thing. And you're like, oh, well, I guess I have to tell about that. Or I can't talk about this because it's just so small. Just, nobody will pay attention. You can go to people. If you're uncomfortable, you have a right to be comfortable wherever yeah. you are. And you can go to your parents or people about that um, and you can follow up on it. I probably should have done a better job of following up in my case, but I think follow yeah, up. And I mean, there, there's, there's the police too. Like if you yeah. really, really want, if you're not getting anywhere, right, there's social workers, like just Google. I mean, I guess you can't when you're inside there, but at the end of our podcast, we always have a ton of numbers that you can call. But there are so many people that are helping or reach out to one of us and we'll find numbers for you that you can call. Absolutely. Or even just like the non-emergency line for your local police department, I'm sure would have resources for you to reach out to as yeah. well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate this. And um, I know, again, that this is going to relate and help those other closeted kids that are inside there and that can relate to what you have discussed and explained on here so i appreciate your vulnerability and allowing yourself just to explain why you are who you are yeah thank you very much for having me on um yeah, anytime if anyone needs support or wants to contact me feel free to i'm more than happy to chat or and do you have an email that they can reach you out or like how would you like them to reach, to, reach um, you yeah, they can reach out. I believe it's Joey Denae at proton.me. I'm yeah, I'll available there. So okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to end this podcast with another song that Bruce Thompson wrote. And it is another incredible song. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for putting these songs out. They are so incredible. They're so healing. And I know that so many people are reaping the benefits from them. So thank you. 
So until next time, everyone, much love to you all. Take care. Bye. like the rich this is my life the holiest rich no one can touch me I'm the top of the tree wanna get to God you gotta go through me glitter and gold bring it all along I'll take it all from you in the name of a God my sheep I believe me I can make no mistake I preach of submission murder and hate Nothing can touch me, I'm so big and strong All of my followers just tag along They want it, I give it, whatever I say They take it as gospel, it's my money making support get a life podcast you can donate internationally via paypal at www.paypal.me forward slash get a life podcast paypal also has a qr code that can be scanned or donate to our get a life podcast gofundme If you're in a high-demand religious group and need help, please go to oliveleaf.network. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me. Check out www.get-a-life.net for Get A Life merchandise, books, and ways to support or get support. Please remember to like this video, Subscribe to get a life and comment.